So um, I want to talk today about faith and persuasion. Faith and persuasion. Now, why do I say persuasion? Well, there's a lot of misunderstandings with people sometimes who don't understand about the Bible. Can you shut that door right here? Can you, uh, so sometimes people think I can just read the Bible on my own and find God. Yes and no. God's plan through Christ was God sent Jesus down as a human being for a reason. If he didn't need to do that as the final plan of really bringing the message to us, then he wouldn't have really needed to come down as a human being because he already created the world and he was already overseeing and he can do whatever he wants. He worked through men, he raised up prophets, he spoke through prophets. But really, it's an incredible miracle that the Bible is the word of God and absolutely the truth. It says it's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. That means it's not just a book, God's spirit God in the Spirit. God is the Spirit of God. He is activating the truth of the Word with, with your faith. So when one comes to faith, Jesus came down, called the first men to follow him. They were fishermen. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they left everything to follow him. That's the plan of really... Jesus was the word of God on earth. In John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning there was, the word, there was God, and then God was with the word, and then the word became flesh and made its dwelling. So Jesus was the walking word of God. And you see, every time he answered or he taught or even refuted the Pharisees uh, on their confusion or their their misrepresentation of the scriptures, or even when the devil came, he never answered his own opinion. He would always answer, even the devil, when the devil tried to tempt him in the desert, he would come back and says, the word of God says, the word of God says. Jesus continued to not only speak, he was God, but he also recanted and, re and, and reiterated the, the scriptures in the Old Testament that had already been brought down by God. So why do we need to have persuasion? Well, we're going to see that today with Paul and every one of us, those who have become true disciples and those who are studying, understand when you grasp this faith, the reason you need to study the Bible, there's not a set time. It's each person must come to their own faith and convictions to really have the faith that can save you by making Jesus Lord repenting and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You must muster up and by examining the scriptures, being eager and saying, do I believe this? Is this is, do I really believe this way of life? Am I going to make the word of God my standard and, when, and understand why the church is here and why we do what we do in the Bible? Once you have that initial elementary understanding of faith, then it's your faith you are ready to make a decision that you know God's not going to change up on you. You're going to stay and you can trust it all the way to eternal life. But he uses men and women to bring the message. He says, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. Not Jesus. And even the, the scripture, and thank you, Alicia, Alicia, for sharing. Um, we looked in John 4 where we saw that Jesus' disciples, Jesus was baptizing more than, the, than John's disciples, you know. And it says it wasn't Jesus, it was actually his disciples that were baptizing. It's kind of interesting because Jesus has already set forth the understanding, preparing them, even though he hadn't died yet, getting them ready to understand that they are going to take that message and run the ball, so to speak. They're going to take the torch and continue to run the truth, the message of God, and bring it through to all centuries and a disciple makes a disciple, makes a disciple, makes a disciple. So how we have our faith is very important on how we speak with the word of God and help somebody else understand it. We don't elaborate on exaggeration. We don't bring opinions. But we, with our own conviction and passion, God said, I'm going to use that to come through when you're looking at the word of God and helping someone else. Because people, yes, the truth is the bottom line. But our encouragement and persuasion when they see that you really believe it and you're living it, God says, I'm going to use that to help someone else really catch that faith and understand this is powerful. Amen? Amen. 
So persuasion. You know, there was a, all kinds of great speakers, great coaches, great uh, military figures, great uh, presidents, great, great people, men and women through the history. You could look up and go, what are some great, the greatest motivational speeches? And so many would come up, right? Why was it a good speech? Because it moved people. It actually called people to change or put it up there where it put them against the fence, where it was so powerful that they, they, it got them to even think to a point where I got to make a decision. It just wasn't lackluster. Like, oh, okay, that's good information. Thanks. No, they, had to, they, they either accepted it or rejected it, but it was powerful because they, the person speaking was putting their life on the line. That's how much they believed. Back in 1980, there was a, they called it the miracle. There was a movie made out made of it, by the way, and it was basically ba- basically based on the 1980 USA Olympic hockey team. And if you know your history, they went up against the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union back then, in the 80s, we had a Cold War. There was a Cold War around the world, so it was like a, it wasn't uh, we weren't there was a lot of tension going on with the United States and the Soviet Union. And this isn't about them against us. I'm talking about the times. Uh, what was happening, but the, but the games, the Soviet unions crushed. No, it was like when you talked about hockey, it was like not even a second. The Soviet union just crushed people. No one could get near them. They were paid. They were raised. They were full time. And our team at that time, you could only use unpaid uh, college students usually that played hockey that got picked for the team. So it's so a lot of young, inexperienced guys were brought together. And in the actual announcement, the speaker, when the upset happened because the USA beat them, here's per quote, Al Michaels was the announcer at that time. And he says, and he actually said, do you believe in miracles? Uh, Call in the closing seconds of the United States miraculous victory over the Soviet Union might be more uh, iconic today, but it proved uh, a perfect bit of really seeing the 1980 underdogs. No one thought they would get there. The game they played before was an exhibition with the same Soviet team. They, the Soviets beat them 10 to four, crushed them. And now they're coming for the real game. And it was like, they already had that in their heads. How can we do this? Well, what got them to win that one game that was important? Well, the, t- the work and the motivation, and they worked hard. There was a coach, Herb Brooks. And, you know, he was probably the toughest, even some would say meanest coach in in hockey, even the team players. But you know what? They'd say they'd still play for him out of anybody else, the hockey players later. When he died in a car accident, so many hockey champions and people came because hockey players or anybody at that level that wants to win, they're not looking for friends. They're looking for someone that's going to push them beyond their levels. And that's what he did. He took that team and he believed in them and he put this belief in this team that wasn't by, that wasn't as good as the other team, but they won. So I'm going to, I want to read what his final speech was. And I looked it up and they made a movie out of it and I want to see if they glamorize it, but they said he actually did say these things. So I want to, uh, to just read his statements right before they went out into the locker room. It's pretty powerful because persuasion and being in someone's life can actually get them to reach higher than they would without you being there. They, they, they're going to do something great. And that's what we can do with each other when we walk with God and share how powerful God is with us. But he started out in the locker room, these young 22 or less kids that weren't even a team. They came together about a year only. And the Soviets have been playing for years together, just a machine. And he started out saying, great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what you have here tonight, boys. That's what you have earned here tonight. One game. If we played them 10 times, they might win nine, but not tonight. Not this game. Tonight, we skate with them. Tonight, 
we stay with them and we shut them down because we can. Tonight, we are the greatest hockey team in the world. You were born to be hockey players, every one of you. And you were meant to have tonight. This is your time. Their time? Done. It's over. I'm sick and tired of hearing about how great a hockey team the Soviet Union is. This is your time. Now go out and take it. And I probably didn't do it as good as the coach did, but these are the words that he said. And you got to ask yourself, they went out, and if you can even pull up YouTube, or uh, yeah, YouTube, USA Hockey 10 Team Victory 1980, you will see the craziness that happened when they won. It was such an amazing, it even breathed like encouragement into the United States, just seeing this inspiration of these underdogs that had no chance to win, and they weren't better by any chance, but that night they took it. And, the, and I believe it's, it's people persuading people that they can do it. They can make it happen. You can make it happen. So as we do that, I want to turn the Bible, and we're just going to focus on Acts 26, because we're going to look at a great man of persuasion, an incredible man of persuasion. And obviously that, that, that uh, monologue from the coach, he had a, a Canada accent, I think. So he'd say, great moments are born from... Great opportunity, but I can't do that one, so amen. <laughs> this is your time. But now I'll have to work on the Canadian <laughs> accent. I'm a preacher, not an actor. How you doing? All right. All right, so let me ask you something real quick before we go to Acts 26. How do we react to faith? How do you react to faith? We all think about faith in different ways. Some think faith should be completely private. That we should live our faith almost incognito, um, undercover. We believe that if we were to truly live out our faith, it might upset somebody. I mean, for me, before I studied the Bible, I believed in God. But my relationship with God was so private, no one knew I had one. Because I did not believe, I didn't know yours. I mean, it was just me and God only really when I was in trouble. But see, some people just don't, don't and not in even a wrong way. They just think it's a very private thing. And yes, it's a personal relationship and you should have private prayer time and time alone with God. He wants that. But some people do it because they don't want to upset anybody. They want to bring it up. And you shouldn't force it, but, but, they're, but, they, but they, it's so private. They just live it undercover. And that's not the way God designed us. And, and you know, uh, our neighbors might not like us anymore. It may prevent us from a job promotion if we bring up just what we believe. So we avoid talking about it and we avoid living it except on the occasional Sunday morning when we come to church or Sunday mornings, right? Hopefully disciples come every Sunday, praise God. But the world thinks, you know, I just go and, you know, it's just about me. This is very, this is very there's a very little difference between us and those without faith. There's also an opposite extreme between us and those with, uh, without faith. There is, uh, th this is the, what I call the in your faith, or in your face faith. These are, and I don't mean to put anybody down, I'm just sharing, we're all trying to learn to be relatable, right? And we gotta trust God. But sometimes people uh, that are zealous, and I was actually one of those when I first became a Christian. I think I freaked my family out where I had to really rethink. I did not. I thought I was like telling the truth when I found it, but uh, you know, I was too too intense. And the and people uh, these people that sometimes think they're bringing the faith, they speak out about everything honestly, just looking for the the disagreement, and they're going to argue it even though they have the truth. They'll yell, they'll scream, they find their way into new programs, they post over social media almost in a way where it's if you you know in a in a, almost a, if you're not accepting it, if you're not with God, I don't even think they mean to do it. But we have to always look, what is our persuasion doing, even if we have the truth? In your face, Christians can come across like they, like they don't care who likes us because we are standing on the truth. And that would be a wrong heart. You need to care what people think, but you're not going to be motivated to compromise the truth. You know, we can, sometimes we can say, Jesus said Christians will suffer, will be persecuted, and that's our battle cry. That's not what he's talking about. You may be persecuted, you know, and, and it may get to the point where 
you know, you'll be, you could be arrested for your faith. That doesn't mean you'd be quiet. Thank God in America, we haven't hit that yet. But we alienate everyone and anyone who might ever get close to us, except those Christians who are doing what, the same thing they're doing. There's a problem with both these extremes. You've got to pray for wisdom. And obviously, you don't hide your faith. And I, I, think, uh, I think if you think about it, I don't think anyone looks, uh, no one looks at the person hiding their faith and says, you know, I love the way you hide your faith. It seems to have so little impact on your life. Tell me more about that type of faith. No one's going to say that, right? If you're so quiet that no one even knows you believe. But the ones with the forceful faith, there's another. There, there's not anyone left that'll be, that you'll be able to talk uh, about faith with because you've alienated everyone from you. You know, the stream case would be seeing that guy with the sign on the corner. Repent or go to hell! And, or he has a microphone. You're all going to hell. You're all sinners. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? I always go, when I see that guy in my mind, the first thing I think is, wow, I want to be close to that guy. I'm so moved. I, I'm already paranoid because I don't know what he's going to do. Turn right in my face with the thing. Go, you need to repent too. And I'll be like, oh, I just wanted to understand what you're talking about. Can we talk quiet? I mean, can you help me? Whoops, I'm off camera. How you doing? And I'm not making fun of anybody. I, I believe everybody, whoever you approach it, we all have to learn how to do it. And don't get me wrong. You don't want to be so cautious because the truth will offend people. But you want to strive as your best to know that's God's truth and God's word that does the, the walking. And if someone's open and has questions, you need to pray for the, the way that you can speak in a way that will benefit them with the truth of the scriptures as you help them build faith. So, you know, I think that person, people would say, I, I would love to know how to have faith that is so offensive it repels everyone. Tell me more about that faith too, right? So there's two extremes, right? We got to figure out in the middle because these are two extremes we, we need to avoid. But more often than not in real life, I believe the first example of suppressed faith is the strongest. A lot of people have, an, have a belief, but they... But they no, they're afraid to share it. They don't want to cause conflict. They're, they don't want anybody to be upset. And it's not to upset people, but God says you need to share your faith. Be fishers of men. I am the light of the world. Let people know Jesus came. He, he came because God wants to save the world. So everyone, whether they know it or not, needs to be saved or, or understand that God died for them to be saved. We need to figure out how we can develop a faith that is real and genuine and visible and persuasive. So let's look at 26 Acts. And I'm just going to kind of go through this because I think Paul does such a great job. If you want to dissect this as, a, as an example of how does a man act in front of people or an audience and get his convictions out without being afraid he's going to get killed. Because here we have Paul that was arrested He's worked his way up, and God allowed Paul to become a Roman citizen, which was a big deal back then. Because as a Roman citizen, you had more rights than anybody else, so they couldn't hold him. And when they were had him before, he said, I want to, be, I want, I want to ask to go to Rome. I want to speak to Caesar. And if you're a Roman, you cannot abuse him. Romans were under the protection of Caesar. So God had allowed that so Paul could have that ace to get moving through these channels of power. And actually, now we find him in the presence of the most powerful man, King Agrippa. And he's in chains. One little snap, he could have his head cut off. What are you going to do? Well, let's see what he does. It says here, Then, King, then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Let's just stop right there for a second. We see at the beginning of this, look at Paul's eloquence. He's not trying to pick a fight. He actually still stays respectful, even though he's in chains for nothing. 
trumped up charges, falsely charged. He's an innocent man. Yet he gives credit and gives acknowledgement no matter what. Respect must be given no matter what. If you lose the respect when you're sharing with somebody or talking with someone, even if they offend you, if you're a Christian, you should be able to take that or don't share yet. You need to be able to understand that God is your rock and you got to get mature enough to not have to fight. And look how he elegantly explains to him. He even, you know, just comes across building this opportunity because this is a king. He's used to everybody bowing to him. So Paul's not sucking up. Paul has wisdom. This guy is going to shut down and go take him away. He can't. He's got to be wise not to be proven himself. It's not him against the king. It's him carrying God's message. This is my chance. And he says here, you know, he commends him. He says, listen, let me, let me please speak to you patiently. In verse four, it says, the Jewish people all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify if they are willing that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? There's a first question that's going to provoke. A, he's definitely thinking. You can't just hear that and go, that's, wow. Verse 9, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison and and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Wow. Many a time I went from synagogue to one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blasphemy. I was so obsessed with persecuting that I even hurled them down in foreign cities, hunting them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. And I heard a loud voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven first, to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to the small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah, the Christ, would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Wow. Wow, let's just stop there for a minute. He's in front of the king 
guards, officials, and all the most powerful people. When King of Crippen goes, bring this guy in. I want to hear him. It was kind of, I think, for amusement, too. I've heard about this dude. So he had all his people, the pomp, his, his posse. There was six black SUVs tented out in front of the palace. That all the important people were there. Where's my pen, Bingo? And thank you. And uh, and look at this moment. He's doing real well. He's like, "Wow, I'm getting this far. I'm sharing the truth. It seems like it's going well." And then out of the blue, Festus, who's one of the important officials, just interrupts in front of all these powerful people and the king and says, you are out of your mind. You're insane. This is crazy. And then he even makes a reasonable, like tries to justify it that, that you know, your great learning is doing this. You need to calm down, you fanatical person. You're just too extreme. Calm down. That's because you don't think a great learning uh, is driving you insane. Uh, the, meaning that you, you just, you know, think about it. That, that, that's almost like a good case. Like you just, you're fanatical. You're too obsessed. Get a balance. So let's look what Paul says here. This is an incredible moment. It could be very, uh, an awkward moment, right? Because you don't know if the king's going to go, you're right. Who is this dude? Then look what he says. I am not insane. Most excellent Festus. Look at the control factor of Paul's me- demeanor and spirit. He puts in most excellent Festus. (laughs) Let's see how you do if someone comes up to you and go, you're nuts, you're crazy, you're a fool, you're an idiot. You believe this, it's ridiculous. You're going to go, I am not most excellent, excellent Chaz, most excellent Sheena. How do you stay that calm? That's, That's the power of God. Right there between the words is the witness. Did you know... 10% of what we actually say is communication. The rest is body language and tone. That's unbelievable. That's a fact. You can just Google that. That's incredible. So he didn't lose it. He stayed calm, which freaked people out because what does he believe? He really believes what he's saying. He's not going to get rocked. He's in change. He could die. What he's saying could go one way or the other. He doesn't know how it's going to go, but he's definitely putting himself up for some death. Why? Because they did the same thing to Jesus when he was speaking in front of Pilate. They killed him. They said, we're going to shut this thing down, dude. And now Paul's talking about the guy they already shut down. They're going, this is supposed to stop. Because they were afraid that Caesar in the Roman empire was going to be caused division by this movement of men and women that believe in an invisible God that died and now is in heaven. What the heck? But it's not insane, is it? Because Paul says it. I know it's not insane. I I know the power of God in my life because I obey by faith and I see the truth of God's protection in problems, trials, and out of problems, trials. All the challenging and sad and crazy things I went through, I stayed the course and obeyed no matter what. And I see God's hand in my life. And you do too if you live by faith. I'm not insane, pal. Excellent Festus, calm down. Have a cream soda. Let's talk. I mean, he he said, I'm not insane. Most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying, and this is so powerful, what I am saying is true and reasonable. Now think about that. Do you believe that when you tell people about God and Christ and how God changed your life? See, if God didn't really change your life, you just intellectually believed. If you became a true disciple and started to really apply what God says, learning to pray, learning to obey, learning to now understand the sins that you weren't even even realizing you were living in, now you're stopping and going, oh, wow, this is for real. This, I, this is sin. I can't, I'm not, I got to change. Wait, do I really want to change? Do I believe this? That's every time you're confronted with pleasure or something that you are trying to fall Jesus on, you get into it and you go, and if you go, oh, gosh, I, I can't sin. I got to, I can't. If you're looking at it that way, you need to stop, probably get on your knees and get deeper faith because you're still looking at it like you're bummed out and you can't go sin. So you got to play the tape. Sin is a smoke and mirrors game by Satan. Get mature. Are you done with the smoke and mirrors con men or are you still someone that gets con so easy? Because of course the beginning and the, and the intro to any sin is going to be, it's awesome. 
You won the 100,000 sweepstakes. Come on in, baby. It's going to feel great, and you will have some euphoric feeling from the sin. But then afterwards, you're going to be dead, depressed, and empty, and it's going to chain you. And you're going to be looking around going, why aren't I happy? Because you bought the smoke and mirrors again. Because Paul's saying what's, this is, I'm not insane. This is true and reasonable. The king, verse 26, the king is familiar with these things. Now look at this powerful statement. The king is familiar with these things. And I can speak freely. I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Now let's just look at this. He's not being cocky. He's actually so convicted. And see, when you really have true faith and you're talking to somebody, everybody, no matter how much faith you have, you aren't going to convert anybody. It's always between God and that person. Jesus even had to walk away when he would speak to people. They would refute him. They would get angry and try to kill him. Uh, his own family said he's insane. His mom said he was out of his mind when she was younger. She came to her senses later and was with him at the cross. And then after he died and raised together, he was, she was with the 12 disciples in Acts 1. And, and the 120. There's 120 only as a movement after all Jesus did and raised from the dead. Only 120 were brave enough to be together at that time. And look what's happened to the movement. But see, when you have faith and you're talking to somebody, you can pick up with your persuasion because it's so convicting to you. He's not, he doesn't have control to, to, to change Grippa's mind, but he does have a control to say, because a lot of times we hold our cards, right? People hold their cards. People don't really reveal what they're, saying, what they're feeling or thinking because it's just fear, lack of trust, don't want to get involved. All of us have that. But as disciples, you understand you, everything is out in the open. It's like you're broadcasting your life from the rooftop. God knows everything, so there's no secrets anymore. So when you're talking to somebody else and you got nothing, no agenda, there's no personal agenda, you're talking, you're looking at him, he goes, King Agrippa, I can speak freely to you. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped your notice. He's basically saying, you're an intelligent man. You're aware. You've seen the preaching. You've heard about Jesus. You know what's going on. This didn't happen in the night. This wasn't a quiet thing. The crucifixion of Christ is ringing around. After he raised from the dead, people, dead bodies broke, came, up, came back from the dead in the cemeteries and went into the city. See, when that, that did happen, you read that. See, now it's thousands of years later, but back then, you, you better believe that was the talk in every house. Good night. Darkness came over the land at 3 p.m. Earthquakes shattering, breaking. The temple curtain torn too, which is thicker than many, like a several phone books. It's just, it was basically God saying, it's done. No man needs to stand before a priest or another man to get right with God. I'm showing you how to get out of darkness into light and have a communion with God. That's why Jesus is here. And he says, you believe the prophets. You know about them. And instead of waiting for him to answer, he goes, I know you do. I know you do. It's like a good salesman that believes in his stuff. He's not trying to blow up. He's not trying to con anybody, but a good salesman really believes what he's selling and it's not a ripoff and he's talking to somebody and people are just afraid. He goes, listen, I know you think this is a great deal. Think about this. And it's not like you're blowing people off, but if you really believe in what you're selling and you care for the people you're selling to, you're going to help them make a decision. They may not, but that's what it is. But this, but internal life, he's going, you got, you know, I know you know this. And look what happens then. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, imagine this moment too. It's intense. All the people are like, I mean, Festus screamed at him, thought it shut it down, didn't shut it down. King Agrippa looks at him and says, Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Wow. Persuade. Now, what would you say if you didn't see what he's going to say? Someone said, do you think you're going to persuade me to be a Christian? Then I'd say it's not about me and you. But look what he says. Paul replied, short time or long. I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today. Festus, I know you think I'm nuts, but I'm not. He's talking about all, they're all the most powerful people in, in the time. All you who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And imagine him say that and he pulls the chains, a little jingle. He's in chains like a peasant in front of the most powerful people. He's speaking confidently and quietly and not getting upset. 
and no fear. That's got to shock people because most people come in front of kings, even if they're not prisoners, they're still like, they don't, you're not supposed to come in a king's presence unless you're summoned. If you come in back then, if you came in without any ask, you could be killed. So anybody, yes, sire, they're like, bow, they bow down. So Paul is composed. He's not like, don't kill me, please don't. He's just, look how he handles himself because he knows God Almighty is with him. He's ready to die. And when you're ready to die, there's no fear anymore. It's not that you want to die, but you're ready to die because you believe it so much. Look what he says here. Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose and with him, the governor and Bernice and those sitting with him. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So at that point, you could go, Paul could go, oh man, no one's open. <laughs> That's not what Paul does. Oh no, no, because that means you're focused on yourself. Oh, are you trying to show, make, want to be convinced again that if someone gets right with God because of you, that, that just confirms you, you believe? Or do you just believe? Because if you believe it, the results are not up to you. You're just here. Because look what he says. I pray to God. He goes, short time or long. He goes, you think you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul doesn't go, oh, I'm going to keep trying. He goes, no, I pray to God. I pray to God that not only you and all who are listening can become what I am. It's all about God. I'm just trying to tell you that God is real and he's changed my life. And I really hope he does you, even though you guys may kill me. What do you think about that? Look at, look at Hebrews 2. Guys, I'm not going to really uh, say much more because this is really all you get. If someone reads this verse, you can either be, who are you? And when you talk to people, you've you got to understand who are they. And it's not, being, not putting them down. Either they're Paul's faith, they're Festus, angry and retaliating. Quit judging me. Don't talk to me. Or, or Agrippa, still acting interesting, but no decisions. Okay, yeah, well, great. You know, and then his pride took over. You think you can persuade me in a short time? And they, then they leave. And no one else said anything. They're just following the power trip. Every one of these people, we always got to be, when we read the Bible, we got to go, who, where are we more identifying with? And then be honest and go, what's God want me to identify with? And that's because we're all, we all have these characteristics. And then when you really come to faith, you break out of them and you start naturally fitting in to the faithful person of, uh, of the way God is right now wanting us to be faithful. Because see, before the session ended, Paul was the prisoner, and he still wasn't changed physically, but Paul became the judge, and Festus, King Agrippa, Bernice, the governor, became the defendants. Paul was indeed defending himself, but at the same time, he was presenting the truth of the gospel, witnessing to the difference Jesus Christ can make in a person's life, and this is the longest of Paul's speeches found in the book of Acts. Paul became the judge, not the judge, judge, but he wasn't in, he was, God was in control. He was speaking the full truth, and now everybody really is before God. They're going to be held accountable by God, the ultimate judge. And see, we're not to judge, but we are to care enough if we know the truth to share. But you see how he flipped it, even though everybody thought they were in control. Paul was actually speaking the truth, and they're all on trial on whether they're going to accept Christ or not. And I believe if we could recreate this scene... You could see Paul walking around, even hear his chains, like, ching, ching, you know, it's like, and you could see him surrounded by a great pomp. They're dressed in the swag robes of that time. Paul must have been looking around at the entire audience when he was speaking. The Greeks, Romans, and of course, would not believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. They just didn't. Not, nor would the Sadducees who were present. They don't believe in that either. To Paul, this was a crucial doctrine. For no resurrection is possible, then that means if it's not possible, then Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead. And Paul had no gospel to preach. And that's what a lot of people say. He's saying, no, this is true and reasonable, guys. You got to break your train of thought and step out of your, 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 your institutionalism that you were brought up in. It's not true. You didn't look into it totally. There's more. You know, it's hard for you to kick against the goads in verse 14. Paul says that. And sometimes people go, that's kind of an interesting saying, because I don't think we say today, you know, I'm having a hard time. I'm, I'm kicking against the goads. How encouraging to know that God in his grace speaks to those who are his enemies. 
That's what it means. God has been dealing with Paul, but Paul had been fighting against him. And he's very humble. He talks with, he doesn't just come in like, I'm Joe Christian. I've had this down forever. He gives his background. I was so out there. I was even, I'm even guilty of conspiracy to murder and even hunting people down. I was totally the worst you could be. I was so far from God and Christ. But I came to my senses and he explains this. Paul has been fighting against God, kicking against the goats. What was his resistance? Well, certainly it was resisting the testimony of Stephen. And Stephen preached this long sermon in, verse, uh, in Acts 22. Paul was there when they stoned Stephen and killed him. And he reiterated the whole truth as well. And they all got angry. And he was the first martyr. If you look at Acts 22, he was, they pelted him with stones. And what they do is they drag him and he fell down to his knees. And he even when he was dying, because you know, when they stone you, they usually tie you to a post. And you, you can't defend yourself. And they just keep throwing rocks, crack your rib, hit you in the face, hit you in the eye. You're just a bloody pulp and you're just like limp and you're, they keep doing it until you die. It's a very, very extreme, painful torture, death. And Stephen was stoned, but before he did that, he preached the whole, reiterated the whole chapter 20, uh, chapter seven of Acts actually talks about Stephen. It's one of the best sermons. It ties in the whole Old Testament and he preaches the word, but it says Paul was there. Uh, confirming the murder. So he heard the truth and he didn't respond at that time, but he did, he did later. So look in uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Because what I said was, why was Paul so relaxed? This is your faith, and this isn't to make anybody feel uh, like a comparison, but really if you want to be honest about who you are, it's how you respond. And we all need grace. So you're never going to respond, but the more you respond with patience and calmness during extreme anxiety or, or things that just out of the blue, the sky's falling, the roof falls in, maybe you plan the best thing and it's all, you still need to be calm. Why can't you do the same things with a calm head instead of running around, oh gosh darn it, and even, even at work. Okay, we didn't see this coming, let's do this, let's do that. People are going to see that, but if you're freaking out with everybody else, you don't, what, what's different? 2.14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might speak the power of him who, locks, who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it's not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to become like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of our people. See, the curtain was torn in two when the earthquake happened because Jesus is now the actual high priest, the mediator. We, because of Christ, and we, when we repent and really have faith that he died and are baptized, our darkness, we're called out of darkness, the, the sin is forgiven, we go into the light. And now Jesus is so-called the high priest, the divine high priest. He intercedes for us with grace and we can speak to God. That's why when we end our prayer, we go in Jesus' name, we pray. Because we always commend God and grateful for Jesus because it's only because of the blood of Jesus and mercy that we can speak to God. But let me ask you this. Are you afraid of death? Do you even think about it? And I'm not saying morbidly, but obviously God instinctually created us if you're a normal, healthy, mental human being you're gonna react and you have instincts to survive and fight and do whatever it takes not to die. We actually are built that way. That's why life insurance, uh, people make a lot of money on that because there's not that many suicides because that's unfortunate when people get in a bad place, Satan's involved in that too at times. Because uh, you, you gotta understand, none of us are going to, none of us do our best to try to be safe. We don't wanna die, right? It's just natural instinct. You're going to do whatever it takes. If there's a bee coming at you, you're still going to go. You, know, you, you don't want to be hurt. Your instincts are always go, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. And Letitia, how you doing? You're out there with Fred. Letitia, she's the only one I know that's not afraid of big, hairy spiders. But all of us have a fear besides her. I'm listening how she's responding in the apartment. Don't get me wrong, speeder, spiders are scary. When I see them, I just close my mind and go full force and like a warrior in Graveheart and go, oh, and I just get it because I'm so, I got to get it because I'm the family dad. I got to get it. Who else is going to get it, right? <laughs> Power of death. Read 14 again with me as he close out. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humility so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. 
That is the devil. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives have held in, were held in slavery by fear of death. See, when he was telling King Agrippa that, he said, why is it so unreasonable to believe God raises from the dead? So if you really believe that, you're not going to die. You're going to go to sleep. You're going to do a transitional period. You're going to go from this, you're going to be in the departure lounge, which everybody is in the departure lounge, whether you believe or not, because you will live forever. It's just where will you be, with God or not with God, which would be hell. Hell is the complete absence of God. Hell wasn't created initially by God for people, but he calls us to obey. It was for demons and, and Satan, but anybody who doesn't want to be with God now, I always say, why would you want to be with God when you die? It's a selfish motive. It's not even pure. You want to be with God when you die because now you're going, it's the only option. I want the best option for me. You got to love God back. Love him. So Paul stood there because he knew that, hey, I'm going to go as far as God tells me to go. I'm going to be right in God's eyes, but I don't worry because I really have a faith that has developed that God is going to use me until he's done if I'm willing to do his will. So right there, nothing's going to stop me dying if he wants to fulfill something in me. And when it is time, man, it's not that bad because, you know, when you die, you die pretty quick. I mean, it's not like you, you know, and then you go. And 10,000 years from now, you won't regret it. 500 years from now, you won't regret it. So guys, faith also takes the person's ability to be humble and be persuaded to believe. And those of us who have faith and are walking need to believe that God's using us to persuade, not force, but talk in a way that we can help those people understand and realize the only thing that you have to trust in is when you open the Bible and you're talking with people, that's the power of God. They may act like Festus, they may act like Grippa, but they still have been ministered to. And even they, if they act like it didn't hit them, God did hit them. The words of God never come back void. So faith and persuasion. Are you going to persuade people about God and what he's done for you? Or does your faith need to be reexamined so you really can persuade? God be the glory.